Thank you, uh, Valentine. Thank you so much and good afternoon to everybody. Hello, so nice to see you. Uh, today we have a lot of people attending this event, so that's always great when you uh, host something that uh, people are really interesting. And I'm also, I'm also really proud of the lineup we have today. We have a lot of interesting speakers and a, a different perspective on the subject of today. Uh, as you already know, the subject is, is bigger, uh, bigger, really better for all due to the recent blockade of the Suez Canal. Uh, my name is Vera Tax. I'm a member of the European Parliament and especially from the Transport Committee. And I'm a member of Parliament since 2019. But before that, I was a politician for 14 years in my hometown, Venlo, and Venlo is in the Netherlands, but it's also five minutes from the German border. And uh, I always explain it like you have all the cargo in the haven of, uh, uh, in the port of Rotterdam, and uh, all, uh, all the cargo there arrives then to Venlo, and from Venlo it goes by inland waterways, by trucks, and uh, train to the rest of uh, uh, Europe. So um, logistics is really important to me. Uh, in Parliament, I have been negotiation, uh, negotiating the initiative report on the uh, maritime transport, and currently we are working on an initiative report on the inland waterways. And as you already know, uh, we are also awaiting several revisions uh, of legislation under the Green Deal. So a discussion as we have this afternoon on the size of ships and port congestion is therefore urgently needed in this context. To, uh, uh, to get all the information that we as, uh, as uh, legislators and as politicians know what type of problems there are and what we could do in the future to make it, uh, to, we hope we can improve it and to make it better. So uh, we all saw the picture of the huge Evergiven ship operated by Evergreen getting stuck in the Suez Canal on the 30, 23rd of March of this year. Also, as you know, uh, with 400 meters, uh, the length of the Evergiving is one of the largest container ships in the world. And this blockade uh, led to very long waiting times for other vessels and had enormous economic consequences. So in addition, the blockade led to delays for weeks and weeks and to port congestion due to capacity problems further down the chain. This also affected the workflow for transport workers. So. This incident is not the first and will probably also not be the last as the size of ships continue to increase. So today, today we will all talk uh, about uh, not only the Suez Canal, but about the consequences of mega ships in general. And uh, I'm really glad also that my colleague uh, Jutta Paulus will co-host this event uh, together with me. Thank you, Jutta, for that. And uh, I will give you uh, the floor now so you can introduce yourself. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vera, and thank you for, for having the idea in the first place. And I really appreciate also your, your experience and your huge knowledge on, on maritime transport, because um, other than you, I'm not from the coast and I'm not really um, acquainted to all the issues. Um, but becoming an MEP in July 2019 and then becoming rapporteur on the MRV file, CO2 emissions from maritime transport. Of course, I um, had to learn a lot in quite a, quite a short time. And I visited Rotterdam, I visited Hamburg, I spoke to a lot of people from port authorities, to ship owners, to ship operators, to workers. So trying to have a, the full picture of this important issue. Um, I'm on the ENVI committee as a full member and I'm substitute member in TRAN and ITRA, so Transport and Tourism and Industry Research Energy and all these, all these committees um, touch upon maritime transport in one way or another, um, not, at, not last but not least with the e upcoming ETS emission trading scheme, which, which will be extended to maritime transport as Parliament has voted for last September with a very large majority of, I think it was 543 people that said we should include maritime into the ETS in order to um, finally start pricing the, the emissions. Um, I will also be following the fuel EU maritime file, which will be um, issued by the commission this year. So there again, we have the maritime issue. I think the Suez Canal blockade, as you have already said, has 
sort of um, highlighted to the broad public the problems and the issues we are facing with mega ships. Um, there was a lot of talk about disrupted supply chains, vulnerabilities of EU supply. And um, while we often hear that bigger ships are more efficient, this is of course true only when they are fully loaded because if a large ship is not fully loaded, then it will transport a lot of thin air, so to speak. And therefore um, it is not automatically the case that the ship is more efficient. What we are seeing also is that the, the port infrastructure has to be adopted to these newer, larger ships um, year after year. And this, of course, is very, are very high costs, which are borne by the public. It's not the ship owners or the ship operators paying, but it's public money. Um, I found out that at the port of Hamburg, it was water debt maintenance cost of 85 million euro in 2015, which was paid by Hamburg, not by the port itself. And this is just Hamburg, right? So if you take into account the whole stretch of the lower Elbe out to the North Sea, there is another 132 millions which go um, into dredging. So I will listen very closely to the presentations um, because I'm really eager to learn more on, on what can we do, which would be a sensible way to approach the issue. And of course, I will do my utmost to um, finally get the maritime sector to work more on climate because um, I'm also the delegate to the IMO where the talks are ongoing last week and this week and there unfortunately not a lot of progress is being made. The, there are now um, agreements on a market-based measure which will probably until 2030 cut just close to three percent of the emissions of the sector compared to business as usual. So it might not even be a, a real cut, but it might even be an increase, which is just not so large as was originally thought. And there, I think the sector really has to do more. Um, we cannot just go on like we have done in the past. There was the UNAB report last year estimating that if every country would be following its path, that shipping and aviation would just be let, let loose, so to speak. Then in 2050, our budget would be um, largely comprised of shipping and aviation. That shows very clearly that we have to get on a path for more sustainable shipping pretty soon because ships are sailing in the seas for decades and we should build sustainable ones as soon as possible. Thank you, Vera, for organizing this, and thank you, Payport, for making it possible. Thank you. Thank you. So now we can continue uh, to our uh, to the introduction of the topic, and therefore we have uh, Olaf uh, Merck uh, from the ETF uh, and OECD, if I pronounce it correct. So welcome, Olaf. Uh, nice to have you here, and uh, please take the floor and uh, give us your introduction. Yes, thank you very much, um, and uh, I'll now start immediately the most delicate operation, which is trying to share my screen. Um, can you see the screen? Yes. Um, thank you very much. My name is uh, Olaf Merck. I, I work at the International <laughs> Council for... Okay, it's also the work And um, thanks so much uh, for the invitation to, uh, to speak uh, today at this event on, on this important theme. I suppose I've been uh, asked um, to... Um, to do this um, because we wrote um, a report on mega ships in 2015. Um, that is the, the first cover you see. Um, and I think there's actually also other publications that we wrote that are related to this topic that, uh, that are relevant. We wrote on alliances, we wrote on maritime subsidies, and I'll um, say more about this in, uh, in the presentation. I think these are subjects that are actually linked. 
Um, I have five questions that I'll try to answer in this, uh, this presentation. Of course, the, the question or the overall question of this, uh, this, uh, this online event is, is bigger, really better for all. Uh, and I'll try to do that answering five questions. Uh, the first is why do we have mega ships? The second is um, how a mega ships foster concentration, who benefits, um, how the policies facilitate mega ships, what did the COVID crisis reveal? And then I'll fi finish with, uh, with some possible policy options. I'll try to go th quickly through it. I have a lot of pictures, but I'll um, uh, show them and not explain everything. So why do mega ships exist? Why do we have these? Well, the simple answer is uh, economies of scale. So it brings lower costs per transported container, per transported TU. Uh, and that's why uh, over the last decade, we have seen the average container ship capacity uh, double, uh, double since 2004. And actually the maximum capacity of these ships have tripled over that, uh, that period. Um, the issue that we identified with mega ships is it means economies of scale on the sea side. Uh, it actually means additional costs on the land side. And of course, I'll say more about this later. This is a picture of the uh, container uh, ship capacity, the average container ship capacity, and the maximum uh, capacity that is in blue. And if you look at the maximum capacity, you see the abrupt um, changes inside, uh, well, almost every, every 10 years, if you look at it. Now, the second question um, is what kind of system did these mega ships uh, stimulate, facilitate? And, um, I think it's important to make a link between mega ships and concentration. Um, <clears throat> if you want to operate a weekly Asia Europe uh, service, you need to have a string of these, these mega ships that are expensive. Uh, and we think this, uh, in a way, is a, a barrier to entry. Uh, and that has resulted in more concentration of the market, uh, which probably was an intended effect of mega ships. And it has also led to more alliances, which is probably an unintended effect of, of mega ships. So a few numbers uh, in terms of concentration. If you compare the market share of the top four op uh, ship operators, it's now 58 uh, percent. That was 30 percent in 2006. Uh, another form of concentration, I think, is the alliance. So this is the cooperation between the carriers on uh, a bundle of trade carriers. Uh, and, and most of this uh, on the uh, East West trades. Um, and if you look at that, you see that the top nine carriers, they are well, regrouped in three alliances together. Uh, they have uh, an 83 market share. Uh, alliances had a market share of 30% in 2006. Then I think there is a third element important to mention here, which is the, uh, the consortia, which is the cooperation on uh, one specific corridor. And this has also become a tool of, uh, of the largest uh, container carriers. So if you look at the numbers, you see that the top nine carriers operate around 85% of the capacity of consortia. Uh, and what is important to highlight here is that consortia are between uh, carriers that are in the same alliance, but also actually between carriers in different alliances. And we, we found that around a quarter of the consortia is actually that. So in a way, consortia act as bridges between alliances, you could say. Um, these are a few pictures to illustrate that. This is the global capacity share of different sorts of consortia. You see this has increased. But I think the, the, the most important thing is that uh, it illustrates that consortia really have become tools for the largest uh, carriers that are also active in alliances. This is what I meant with consortia as bridges between alliances. Uh, of course, you have the large carriers in alliances, but you also have strong links between the carriers that are in different alliances. So in a way, you could say there is um, one conglomerate of consortia that, uh, that does most of the liner shipping. Now, the question that you wanted me to answer also is uh, who benefits from this? Um, so identified the shippers, port terminals and maritime service operators 
uh, shipbuilders and equipment manufacturers, the environment, and then of course also the carriers. When you look at uh, shippers, um, in a way shippers benefited from uh, moderate freight rates uh, until last year, basically. Um, but the mega ship uh, model and mega ships in general have also led to declining service frequency, so less and less weekly services, and also um, less choice for shippers when it comes to uh, well, services, but also operators. Um, ports and terminals, uh, well, it has already been said, they need to uh, invest to be ready for these mega ships. Uh, and at the same time, um, uh, it's also becoming increasingly difficult to recover these costs from, uh, from, from the, uh, the shipping companies. And then it also leads, mega ships lead to, uh, to more peaks in ports in, in terminals. Uh, another effect is, is also the redundancy of, uh, of a lot of the secondary ports uh, that, uh, that are no longer on the main uh, lines of, uh, of the bigger ships. Um, who benefits? Well, certainly the, the shipbuilders and equipment manufacturers, of course, because <clears throat> in a way, these cycles of, uh, of uh, let's say, upsizing of ships uh, have, has meant that uh, uh, a lot of uh, new ships have been built, obviously, but also new equipment, including, for example, container cranes. And a lot of these manufacturers and shipbuilders uh, come from, from Asian countries, I should stress that. Um, well, did mega ships benefit the environment? And it's a question that was also reached, uh, also raised in the in the introduction. Um, well, larger ships uh, lead to, to less CO two per TU kilometer. Uh, that is that is uh, that is a fact. Um, does it lead to less emissions? Well, that would only lead to less emissions if half of the world's population would live in, in Shanghai and the other half would live in, in Rotterdam, to, uh, to put it a bit schematically. Of course, what happens in practice is that, uh, that the, the, let's say, that there is an increase in TU kilometers because there is some sort of a hub and spoke system related to, to mega ships. So there are less direct port to port connections, which means that the people that live in these, these port cities and these destinations still need to get their cargo. And they get this in the end by, uh, by smaller uh, coastal ships or maybe even by trekking. And then you could also say there's uh, probably peak effects in, uh, in port cities. Uh, of course, the peaks of these very uh, large ships, and that is of course more relevant to, uh, to emissions like NOx emissions and, uh, and particles. Uh, finally, who, who benefited? Um, well, certainly uh, over 2020 and, and, and what we're seeing now, um, the carriers, they have had a record profit margin in the first quarter of, uh, of 2021. A few pictures to, uh, to illustrate. Um, this is the development of the freight rates. rates. Um, these are global uh, ocean freight rates. Um, and these are the uh, China-Europe freight rates. The picture looks more or less similar, uh, but there are uh, a few differences and I'll, I'll, I'll get to that shortly. Uh, one of the differences is a question of, uh, of, of timing. Uh, of course, freight rates are, let's say, the, 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 the rates that the shippers pay for, for their cargo. Then there's always also surcharges and uh, what we what we saw is there also been uh, uh, various rate increases in, in some of these uh, surcharges. Um, less choice for chip shippers. Uh, I, I already mentioned this. Uh, for example, the number of ship operators servicing the Netherlands and their ports have, uh, has halved uh, over the last uh, 15 years. I take here the example of the Netherlands because, because of the, the host uh, of, these, of, the, of this online event, but of course this is, this is also true, maybe, maybe even more true for, for some other countries. Um, a declining weekly service frequency, well here I took the example of, of Germany, um, uh, it has declined by, um, by 40% uh, over the last 15 years and the direct calls have declined by 30%. So um, ships have gone bigger, but the result is that more of the car is, of course, uh, in, these, in these big ships and the number of services has actually gone down. So less 
choice for, for shippers, uh, less operators, uh, and actually also less differentiation in the services that are provided. Um, well, there's a lot more uh, that you could say about what's happening um, uh, when it comes to the service uh, quality. Um, I, I simply refer to a lot of the, the good work that has been done by uh, the Global Shippers Forum and MDS Transmodal that have uh, started a regular monitoring of, uh, of uh, service quality of uh, container shipping to Europe. Um, something that you think a regulator should also be interested in, in doing, but this is now done by, uh, by them. Then the ports and, and the terminals, they uh, of course are faced with a lot of costs they need to make to, uh, to adapt to, uh, to these mega ships. That is the same for, so for ports, for terminals, and also for, for maritime service uh, providers. I listed some of the costs. Um, uh, and, and then there's also the peaks that are related to these much bigger ships that they have to, have to deal with. Um, so higher cost, but at the same time, uh, also less possibility somehow to recover these costs via, for example, via port fees. So if you if you look at this figure, this is this is uh, the, the data from from one carrier, where it, it clearly shows that the port fees that uh, well that they had to pay, but that have been collected by ports, declined by thirty percent over the last decade. Um, well, who benefited? Um, if you if you look at <clears throat> this picture, you clearly see that uh, there were. Uh, Profits uh, in the, in the previous uh, previous uh, quarters, <clears throat> but that uh, especially 2020 and also the first quarter of uh, 2021 have been very profitable uh, quarters, reaching now uh, 500 uh, euros of profit per container that is transported. That brings me to um, the fourth issue, which is how um, a lot of different policies have actually facilitated mega vessels and, uh, and, and also this mega uh, vessel system, if you like. Uh, a few uh, observations to make here. Um, first, uh, ship size is not regulated, it's not included in the EU weights and dimensions directive, uh, of course, unlike uh, a lot of the other transport modes. Um, mega ships are actually publicly funded. Uh, there is state-backed financing in terms of loans and guarantees, uh, accelerated depreciation uh, for, for shipping firms, which stimulates, of course, a lot of the investment in, uh, in, in these ships. Then there's also very low effective tax, tax rates for the shipping sector via uh, tonnage tax schemes. And a lot of these tonnage tax schemes are in, uh, in Europe. And then there is funding for ports to uh, adapt to, uh, to the mega ships. Then there are sh sh shipping specific exemptions from competition rules, um, in particular the consortia, consortia block exemption regulation, and also EU regulation that uh, support vertical integration of, of carriers, uh, in a way also creating market uh, distortion via the decisions that were made on ancillary activities and tonnage tax schemes. And finally, there is uh, port pricing with very low cost coverage in, uh, in ports, uh, which is in a way also facilita facilitated by the port competition uh, that, uh, that is uh, at the core of uh, Europe's uh, port uh, policy. Again, a few uh, pictures. These are the effective uh, tonnage tax rates in uh, European countries. So basically between 0.5% and 2.5%, uh, which, which obviously is much lower than the, uh, the, the average uh, corporate uh, income tax uh, rates. Um, and these are the ancillary activities, some of them, uh, that, uh, that can be covered by different tonnage tax schemes uh, in Europe, uh, as, as also approved by decisions of the European Commission. Um, I mentioned this because, uh, in a way, this has also stimulated the vertical integration of, uh, of carriers uh, that can, can uh, are of course also uh, doing these ancillary activities and, and uh, that can be brought under tonnage tax schemes 
in, uh, in these countries. Brings me to um, the, uh, of course, the, the important question, what actually uh, about the COVID crisis and did it reveal anything about this, this system? Um, this is what uh, a major carrier has to, to say about the, the, uh, the situation in which we are, uh, which, which has the three specific causes for in the supply chain situation at the moment, a demand explosion, um, the bottleneck are carriers and there is a shortage of containers. And the question that I'll try to answer here is, is, is this a convincing story for what's actually happened in, uh, in Europe? Um, the demand explosion, if you actually look at the, the monthly container volumes that were tra transported to and from Europe, um, you see that the volumes uh, over uh, 2019 were actually uh, 1.7 million containers higher than over 2020. So there wasn't really a demand explosion in 2020. Uh, in the first quarter of 2021, um, there was a little bit more demand than the first quarters uh, of uh, the, of the, the 2019, but uh, it is more or less in, in line with what you call a regular growth rate. So demand explosion in Europe, not really. Actually, what's the, taking place is there is a lot more demand in the US uh, and that uh, apparently is impacting the situation in Europe. Is there port congestion in, in Europe? Well, we, we looked at um, what are the added, the canceled and shifted calls in the port of Rotterdam in the first quarter of uh, 2021. Um, and what we saw is, um, well, there are very few added calls in, in Rotterdam. There are quite a lot of canceled calls in, in Rotterdam. So that seems to show that, uh, well, the, the port is, uh, is, is quite full, uh, but actually a lot of uh, added calls elsewhere in, in North Europe. So that seems to suggest that uh, if uh, carriers can go, go to Rotterdam, they can actually go to another port in, in North Europe. So if one European hub port is full, other ports actually seem to function as a, as a backup. Uh, backup. Um, well, that hasn't happened in, uh, in the port of Los Angeles and Long Beach, where we've all seen the stories in the media about how, how many ships uh, were uh, there lying at anchor, uh, for to, uh, just waiting for a spot to, uh, to, to open up in, uh, in the port. Um, the question that you could ask there, of course, is, is that actually port congestion or uh, did it start really with uh, ship schedule reliability? And if you look at the numbers, you see that the reliability uh, on Shanghai, Los Angeles, Long Beach actually started to go down much earlier than, uh, let's say, the, the, the demand surge in the port of uh, LA Long Beach. Uh, interesting to note as well is that um, there is, uh, let's say, the, 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 the worsening of the schedule reliability uh, in, in the Port of Long Beach and, and, and uh, Los Angeles coincides with the uh, the maximum, uh, with a strong increase in the maximum size of ships that uh, that went to the ports. So. Uh, let's say a lot of the, um, the mega ships that were usually on the Asia Europe uh, route were also used in LA Long Beach. Um, and uh, uh, these ships were in the, the second quarter of 2020, the third and the fourth were also used. Um, so um, one could wonder if, if there isn't a link there as well. So um, what, what did the COVID crisis reveal? Well. Um, probably also a misalignment of capacity and incentives to, uh, to solve the, the bottlenecks. Um, so the possibilities to divert traffic to other ports in case of congestion, well, it seems to work in, uh, in, in Europe, but it's complicated in some, some other parts of the world. Uh, and that is related obviously to the upsizing of, uh, of ships uh, because there's only a few um, ports in some parts of the world that can actually handle these ships. And also because carriers have uh, interests in, in terminals, so will choose to go to their own terminals. Um, then I think uh, that, that should be mentioned as well is that uh, carriers have shown remarkable uh, joint capacity management, if you, if you want. So that is the coordinated capacity withdrawal. Um, 
uh, that obviously was uh, was there to avoid losses, uh, but has actually now also led to uh, to record profits. Um, important point to make there is that most most of the consortia uh, that that are there actually exceed the thirty percent threshold in the EU uh, regulation. So it, this starts to become an issue that uh, that probably needs to be looked at. Um, a few slides there. Uh, they have uh, joint capacity management, so they can withdraw capacity if they if they need, which is what they what they did during the uh, the COVID crisis, and this has led to uh, uh, twelve percent uh, idling of ship capacity in uh, at the height of the, uh, of the of the COVID crisis in the week twenty two in twenty twenty. Olaf, if, if you could just speed up a bit because we we are already running over time. <laughs> yes, I'll uh, I'll to go try to go quickly uh, through this. Uh, I just wanted to say this this um, raises a couple of questions. I think that that, that uh, deserve to be answered. Uh, one of the questions is uh, well, the freight rates already started to rise in late twenty twenty. Um, but the ship capacity was only back to normal in September, uh, September 2020. Uh, another point to make is that uh, the freight rates in Europe only started to rise really in the, the fourth quarter, um, when uh, there was actually much less capacity uh, put on Europe trades than on Trans-Pacific trades. So that is also uh, something that, well, that's, that, that is interesting to note. Coming to the end, then um, the mega ship model is not really resilient. Um, well, what did we see? We, we saw that problems with schedule reliability of mega ships in Los Angeles can lead to supply chain problems in Europe. We have seen that freight rates for European cargo can get six times higher, even if there's no more demand for uh, ocean freight in Europe. Uh, we've seen that carriers can collectively redeploy capacity between train, uh, trade corridors in order to maximize profits. Um, also, that mega ships have actually created this uh, system of hubs and spokes, uh, and but that this model is is very vulnerable to any disruption to any specific hub. And that container shipping has developed into a conglomerate of consortia mostly invisible, but uh, also it seems uh, fairly untouchable. My last slide is just a couple of possible uh, policy options uh, that are related to this. Um, ship size, uh, some countries, uh, they, they regulate ship dimensions, competition, um, so uh, questions to be asked about capacity management of carriers, uh, some strategic utilities have uh, tariff regulation. Uh, well, if container shipping is a strategic sector, maybe also there. Um, building up capacity to monitor competition in liner shipping, for example, in line with what the US uh, has done with a specific federal um, maritime commission uh, and the special treatment of liner shipping and competition law. Then there is something about state, ex, state aid and taxation, uh, the tax loopholes in shipping. There's an ongoing discussion on the global minimum tax and, and of course, the question whether shipping should be included or not. Uh, there are market distortions created in EU tonnage, tonnage tax schemes, how to address that. Um, and a, a lot of the shipping subsidies uh, are there without a lot of public goals and conditions, and that is something that we also in the past advised to look at. And finally, something on, on port pricing, uh, a possibility would of course be to uh, introduce minimum port charges to actually make sure that uh, public investment gets recovered. And I'll end here. Uh, I hope this was uh, helpful for your discussion. Happy to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Olaf. I think that was really very interesting, and uh, it would be great if you were, um, if you would be so kind as to share your slides, because there have been several questions already in the chat whether we could have the slides for further, um, for further perusal, just to reflect upon the numbers. It was, of course, a lot of information, and thank you for much for so much for the comprehensive approach here. We will now move to our first panel. And there, um, we would like to look at the economic rationale 
bit behind big ships. Olaf has already told us a lot about this and I would like to introduce our first panelist, which is Nicolette van der Jag, I hope I pronounce it correctly, from ClickUp. And ClickUp represents freight forwarders. So your clients are shippers, exporters, importers, if I remember correctly. How is your assessment of the model of mega ships? Are these economies of scale really coming true? And um, what does this mean for you as a freight forwarder? Nicolette, please. I can't see Nicolette, does anyone see her? Her microphone is still up. Ah, sorry, okay, my apologies. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Paulus, and, uh, and also Mrs. Tax um, and the European Parliament for organizing this debate. Uh, I think it's an extremely important topic, and I'm really happy that, that this is brought to the attention of the Parliament. Um, it is, of course, challenging to talk after Olaf Merck, uh, because basically he raised everything, and I have to say that, that as an economist, he always uh, points to the, um, the right topics, and I think his analysis is, is completely correct. I can only repeat some of the things, uh, maybe from a little different perspective, from the perspective of the faithful waters and the logistics service providers. But overall, I think his uh, analysis is, is extremely complete, and, and I can't agree more with uh, all the points that have been raised. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll come from a little different perspective, as I said, because I think that, that indeed our perspective is, where are we today? Are our members, which are indeed the logistic service providers, still able to serve their clients, the, the shippers? And I have to say that, that, that today the situation was bad uh, a year ago, but today it's, it's only getting worse. Of course, the, the, the topic for today is, is uh, the reference has made the picture of the, uh, the enormous um, large container vessel in the Suez Canal. Today, we're in a situation where uh, we see further congestion, which is caused by, um, well, sort of the, the COVID crisis picked up again in, in, in China, Southeast China. Uh, we see that the port of um, Yangtze is being blocked. So I think, as um, Olaf said, the um, the situation today is only getting worse, and um, the, the current crisis, can't, the, 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 the current maritime supply chain is not, not able to cope with it. Mm -hmm. um, we see a continuous shortage of vessels, of equipment in the global container shipping markets. It's, uh, it's, it's everywhere, it's hindering the economic recovery. Um, I, th I think that our members will equally the shippers and, and many of them are contacting me also from other associations representing all sort of industries, the industries of toy manufacturers, of, of uh, vehicle manufacturers, spare parts, biking industries, uh, everybody is sort of in shock at the moment because of uh, not only because of the high price and that is of course impacting a lot of the SMEs but also the collapse of service performance because basically it's becoming impossible to, to plan. Um, you, you see it now, if you want to book a container, it can take you three months. Um, so this is, this is really getting, getting really, really bad. Um, we also see that, I think that the consumer is starting to feel the impact. Um, I don't know whether you or whether personally uh, was confronted with it, but, but for example, I, I go to shops and I can't buy my spare parts for my bike. It's difficult to get hold of uh, some sort of, of uh, cartridges for printers. I think more and more the consumers will, will feel it. And then also, of course, I'm afraid that some SMEs will go out of business. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, where is this, uh, this all coming from? This, of, this session is of course about the economic rationale for big ships. Um, and indeed, we did support the, the, the economic uh, analysis from the ITF back in uh, 2015. And I do think that the arguments still stand, but maybe at that point in time, the freight rates were indeed relatively low. Um, but the, the, at that point in time, carriers will still in the red race to invest in, um, in bigger ships without really consulting their, their customers, without mm -hmm. really asking whether there was not a need for smaller ships. 
to better serve some of the markets because as I explained, you, you always have to, to bring your containers door to door. So there are longer stretches on the land side. It sort of and then increases the, the pressure on the, on the infrastructure. Um, and, and of course the cares would only look at their, their economies of skill and at the seaside. Uh, uh. Oops. <laughs> okay. Um, my intention is not to hit out the carriers. I'm, I'm afraid that we already did so, but, but to look really at the um, what what happens because we we do know that that carriers did just prior to the crisis, the pandemic, uh, did say that they were uh, looking. They were supposed to focus more on service levels. Um, this was clearly too late. Uh, service levels have never been so low as they have been today. The question also is, as explained by uh, Olaf, that um, how much room is there to really uh, offer different services if major shipping lines are organized in only three alliances sharing their vessels? Uh, there is no room for competition. Uh, we do not see uh, new entrants in the market, except for uh, maybe a few established NISA operators, the investments to compete with established and highly protected alliance system members simply too high and it's it's clearly operating in in, in a closed market um yeah then then of course we see that that um at the beginning of the crisis no a service levels only became worse uh, we saw that sort of the capacity management was being introduced because of course yeah the carriers were afraid that that the month was going down the opposite happened but there was massive blank sailings already at the very start of that crisis of the pandemic. Even before the pandemic, um, there were blank sailings. At the point that, that sort of everything was so disrupted that even when capacity came back in September, um, the car continued to be rolled because um, the system was already too disrupted. Smith yes, I mean we have seen we have seen all of slides also on okay. that, right? That, I'll, I'll um, that. and the capacity well, went up in the in the US, so yeah. that was also an effect, I guess. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry that I'm that I'm jumping in here, but um, I'm the person who has to look at the time, so I would um, propose that we first collect the input from our three speakers from the panel, and then we could go to the discussion in Q&A. And I'm happy to introduce to you Jacob Armstrong from TNE Transport and Environment, which is an NGO focusing on the environmental cost of transport, and especially also on of shipping. This is one of the very few NGOs that is really looking um, in depth into the issue. And yes, Jakob, nice to have you here. And I, I would like to know what does TNE say? Um, I mean, of course, a bigger ship is usually more energy efficient per unit, but is this always true? You have probably collected a lot of intelligence on this issue and you can tell us whether the less CO2 per ton kilometer is really true or whether we have an increase maybe even in kilometers because you maybe cannot sail to the port which um, you actually would like to sail to because your ship is just too big. So Jakob, please, what's your assessment as an NGO? Yes, so thanks very much, Ita. Um, in terms of so in terms of the kind of cl uh, the, the climate and environmental risks of, of these big ships, I think there's kind of two, two things to think about. First of all, there is the, the local risks. So we're talking about the things in ports, for example, dredging that you'll need to do more regularly, which also brings up a lot of CO2. Uh, you're looking at things like more discharges, oily discharges, also scrubbers and things like this. And then there's also kind of local environmental things in, in the deep sea. So you're looking at things like you're thinking about things like noise pollution uh, from marine species. So there's all of these issues which, which need to be taken into account for the biggest ships. Uh, but then, of course, what we're looking at in particular is the wider climate impact. And of course, as, as has been said, the main thing about these bigger ships is that they're sold essentially on the back of, of the energy efficiency. So, you know, the whole point is that, you, you know, if you can get everything on this ship, then you've got great energy efficiency. But I think one of the things that Olaf mentioned as well at the beginning is it's not clear and I don't think it in quite not yet enough research has been done on this if that translates in the total system to better um, environmental performance, especially with this hub and spoke uh, model, if you know how, how it works in terms of the, the networks. 
But when you're looking at the individual ship, I think there is a big problem here because the point about these bigger ships is they do have, especially when they're going at speed, uh, a bigger, kind of relatively bigger um, uh, emissions. emissions. Um, and so one of the things now is that because you've got these bigger ships, but they're very, very rarely fully laden, then that those external environmental costs are not taken into account by these these by the ship owners and the ship operators. Um, so I think basically one thing maybe looking kind of forward is that uh, this is very important going forward that you need to put a price on those emissions so that the, the ship operators can can actually have an efficient have the proper energy efficiency. They can actually make those energy efficiency and environmental efficiency gains, which we don't have so far. And then maybe just the, the second point, uh, and then we can move on to and let other people speak, um, is the issue about space as well, because I think the point about these big ships is because they're not fully laden, it means there's, there, there are space on these ships. Um, and there was a very good study done last year by the ICCT, which looks at the uh, ships going from the United States to China, so one of the longest trade routes. And it kind of looked at this issue of fuels, because obviously right now we use fossil fuels, which are very, very impressive and they have very, very good energy density. And the point about new clean fuels like hydrogen, ammonia, other things like this, is they will have less energy density. So one of the arguments we hear often is if we move to those clean fuels, there will be big issues because of space, not enough space on board. But what this ICCT study found is that on that trade route, one of the longest trade routes in the world, if you just take 5% uh, of cargo space, then you would make room for, for hydrogen, uh, hydrogen engines like having, having the, the more space for the, the fuel. And obviously hydrogen is not as energy efficient as other things like ammonia. So basically I think this is one interesting thing just to take account into account when we have the conversation it is about this issue of space. So maybe I'll leave there, uh, but uh, yeah, happy to kind of talk, talk more things later. Yes, thank you very much, Jakob. And I think there, there will, of course, um, be questions, but um, I would like to give the floor first to Martin Dosman from the European Chamber of Ship, uh, Ship Owner Association. I'm, I'm probably got it wrong again, although I have met you numerous times. I'm terrible with those acronyms. Um, we have heard the rationale, the economic rationale um, behind the model of big ships. And I would like to know, is this really true for all ship owners? Are all ship owners happy with this concept of big ships? Because I know that the European ship owners are a very heterogeneous um, group and we have a lot of SMEs which might not have um, the mega ships um, under their remit. And I would like to know how do you view the current crisis? We have heard that many shipping lines have blamed port stakeholders for congestion, but what Olaf has shown us is a bit contradictory to that. So I would like to know how you assess the, the current issue and also the development towards ever larger ships from the perspective of, of the European ship owners. Yes, uh, thank you, Jutta. Um, Olaf raised a lot of topics, so I don't know how long I'm uh, able to uh, and allowed to speak. Uh, but let me start with some general remarks about uh, the ship size. I think uh, we have to realize that in all shipping segments, um, ship size is increasing. And that's a phenomenon that, that is part of the history of shipping. Ships become bigger. Uh, not only container vessels, we see it on all segments. If we look at the ferries now sailing between Hook of Holland and, and, and the UK, they are not comparable to the, to the ferries, uh, let's say 30 years ago. And why is that? Because the cargo volume is simply there. There is a need for bigger vessels. The, 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 and vice versa, uh, the increase in, um, in the ship performance and especially the containerization made it possible to transport uh, goods globally at, at a lower cost uh, all over the last uh, decades. And we should also not forget that that increased, of course, global wealth considerably. Hundreds of millions of people uh, were able to raise from poverty to get a better uh, standard of living, all due to shipping. So let me start with that. If, if, uh, if I turn to environmental uh, um, performance of shipping, we are on the pathway to become, let's say, climate neutral. We want to decarbonize. And yes, there should be a price on emitting CO2. We support it as industry. There should be a business case to switch to the alternative fuels, 
once they are there. They are not there at this moment. So, but we are supporting uh, the, the carbon price idea. So, and we put proposals forward to, to the IMO. Um, returning to um, the, um, the, the, the question of larger vessels and, and let's say port performance, ports, they, they accommodated the, the larger vessels over the last, let's say, centuries. Uh, Rotterdam, uh, well, the most recent extension was mass Flakte 2, but before that it was mass Flakte 1. So increasing the port capacity to deal with the increased cargo volumes, that's not nothing new. It's, it's a practice. And the question, of course, that was also raised, who is financing that investment? Yes, sorry, there's some labor <laughs> doing some work. Uh, who's financing that? Uh, public authorities, of course. Uh, but uh, if it's if it is public infrastructure, who who is financing that? It should be part of the port fees. Uh, there should be clear rules uh, for financing public infrastructure and ports so that ports can't compete with each other on that public expenditure. There's, there should be clear rules uh, for that, and that's an EU obligation. Um, if now turning to COVID and the impact of COVID, yes, reliability is, is extremely low. All the major container liners recognize and they do their utmost to improve it as quickly as possible. And they don't blame ports. It's a combination of, of factors that's extremely rare. Of course, first we saw the, the uh, uh, impact of COVID in China with factories closed in the first quarter of 2020. They, China recovered remarkably quickly. Nobody expected that. But at the same time, Europe closed down. So there was a remarkable uh, disbalance between uh, demand and supply of goods. Ports in, in the US, huge congestion, not uh, of because also port workers fell ill due to COVID. Uh, shortage of container because demands uh, picked up so quickly. The latest, latest forecast of the World Bank published last year, they expect a growth of the world economy this year by 5.6%. It's the strongest, and now I quote, it's the strongest upturn after a crisis in 80 years. We are living in very special times, not only COVID, but also the very strong economic recovery we now experience and all the container vessels are sailing, except the one that has to go into a, 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 ship, a, a shipyard for maintenance or for the compulsory uh, inspections. But all capacity is used. New build orders, if you look at the new build orders now placed at the yards for container vessels, it's huge. So the container liners see the demand, they expect it will continue and they start ordering. So they do everything to, uh, to increase the reliability because they also recognize the service levels now that's, that's much too low. Um, on some other topics that, that uh, Olaf raised uh, on alliances, and, and let, let me start with that alliances, the, the container block exemption regulation. Alliances are possible under an EU regulation that was approved recently by DG Competition. We all know how tough Commissioner Vestager is on topics. Uh, we know the court uh, uh, cases she brought forward against the big multinationals. So if that commissioner is in blue, uh, approving consortia block exemption regulation, there is no issue regarding competition. Can't be the case. Uh, concentration, there is a nice index that uh, displays the level of con concentration, and if it's uh, below a certain level, there might be issues for, for let's say, competition. The index is way above that, 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 uh, that um, minimum level, let me put it that way, that way. So in addition to all the nice graphs that, that Olaf showed, we need figures. We need statistics. We don't need uh, graphs suggesting a correlation, but we need to discuss evidence-based. We need to, uh, to agree on a joint uh, understanding of the factual situation. And then we are able to start uh, discussing what is the situation? What can we do uh, about it? Is there a need for dialogue? Of course, a dialogue is 
always needed. That's why I'm pleased that we now have this uh, discussion. Uh, but if there's a dialogue, should it be at Brussels level or should it be at national or, or local level? And one final remark on, um, on um, the public uh, investment in infrastructure, it's not only shipping. I worked for uh, the Betu route, uh, the rail connection between Rotterdam and the German border. The Betu route is financed by the government. The fixed investment costs are financed by the public, by the taxpayer. I also pay for the Betu route. Um, the maintenance cost that is charged to, to, the, to the user, so the rail operators. If the fixed investment cost would be charged to the rail operators, it simply won't work. It was way too expensive. But the bigger interest, of course, for the society as a whole is that there is a, a model split uh, uh, for transporting containers from Rotterdam to Germany. So not only trucks, but inland waterways. And the same applies to inland waterways. Investment in bridges, in uh, locks, it's public money because there's a bigger social in, uh, societal interest. So that's a couple of remarks. I realize I can go on for hours, but uh, the, the presentation by Olaf, Olaf forced me to, to give a little bit yes. longer answer. Thank you very much. Yes, I won't let you to go on for hours. I was just about to say, and I find it very interesting because you more or less contradicted to um, Olaf and said, well, we need figures. I actually had the impression that the graphs are underlined by, um, are filled with figures because as else you can draw a graph. But um, I would like to come back to some questions which were more or less raised in the chat. One would, um, was, already asked a bit before, and it, it's um, turning rather to the environmental side, how could other environmental costs beside, of course, CO2 emissions be taken into account? What would be a possible model to price these? So maybe that would be something that um, Jakob could elaborate on. And um, I think it was very interesting to hear that the port fees should cover the dredging cost and that we need EU rules for that. I think Vera and I have to look into the treaty which, whether the, um, the EU would, be, would even be able to um, apply such a regulation because usually member states are quite well special when it comes to their own competences and they're usually not so happy when the EU comes in and says, well, we want um, something being done differently. And one last remark on your, on your comparison with the rail. Well, shipping does not pay taxes at all in, within the EU, as, at least as long as um, the ships are not flagged with an EU flag, which the majority is not. But first to Jakob, and then maybe um, we don't have a lot of time, we only have two minutes left. Maybe um, someone knows whether we can do something from the EU level to, um, to the port fees being, being um, attributed to the dredging cost. Uh, thanks, thanks, Jutta. So, so on the question of kind of how to price or, or I think how to regulate would be a better kind of uh, kind of more broader way to, 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 to go at the problem. Some of these environmental things. And the first thing that, that you just said is that, first of all, we need to we need to get the shipping to pay for its environmental impact because it is one of the only sectors in Europe, in the world that doesn't pay for the external costs. I think the point about public money going into different things, be it, uh, you know, port infrastructure, be it as well, um, one thing that I didn't mention at the beginning as well is is in 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 10 years time what one of the ways we're going to reduce emissions from shipping is port electrification it's making uh, ships at birth uh, plug in so that they will you know direct electricity the most uh, direct way to, 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 to reduce emissions um, but this implies a lot of uh, a lot of investment as well from the port side and the point is like a lot of these questions is who, who is going to pay at the moment, shipping is paying for nothing, whereas all of the other sectors are paying for their environmental costs. So this is one thing that is just basic. You need to set, have some mechanism, uh, at least on Europe, uh, to, to, to get shipping to pay. And that, that's, that's just um, um, kind of basic. And then maybe just to touch on the other thing is how, how, how to price or how to deal with other things like, um, you know, the, the other uh, environmental impacts. I think there's a there's a whole range you, you, of things you can do, but it doesn't necessarily have to be paying. So things like noise at sea, part of this is to get ships to go f to go slower, 
And this is something very easy that, 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 that gets noise, that helps biodiversity and also will reduce emissions. There's things like open loop scrubbers that you can ban and that will in, improve, uh, that will improve uh, water quality. It will have less, bio, again, less um, invasive species, less biodiversity risks. Uh, and then there's things like dredging. First of all, you need in terms of figures. Absolutely, we need to do things like look at dredging, see its uh, its CO2 impacts, see its other kind of uh, environmental impacts of that. You need to look at as well. But so it's it's about first of all in terms of the wider climate impact. It's about pricing shipping and make sure shipping pays like every other sector. And then the second thing is there's a lot of individual issues which shipping needs to look at as well um, for for the local and 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 kind of wider community good. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jakob. And there was a very interesting question in the chat um, asking for the views of each participant of the panel are ever bigger ships the only way forward because um, what we have heard a lot on the European level, but also on national level after the COVID crisis with the disruption of the supply chains, a lot of people said, well, shouldn't we reshore some of the production to Europe in order to make our economy more resilient towards um, disruptions, be it through COVID, be it through climate issues, be it through whatever thing we can maybe not even imagine today. And are, is there another way than ever bigger ships? And I mean, everyone here knows that a lot of things that are shipped across the ocean are just shipped across the ocean because shipping is so incredibly cheap. We all know this, this example from the pairs of of uh, Chile, which are shipped to Thailand to be peeled and packed and then shipped to the US. And no one can tell me that this is environmentally viable or efficient. So we all know that there are a lot of things being shipped um, for many, many thousands of kilometers or miles, so to speak. And um, so I would like to hear from each panelist, is our bigger ships the only way we can imagine a global economy? Or is it possible maybe to, within the Green Deal, within circular economy, within longer use of goods, to rethink also the way we transport things? And I will give each of you one minute and then I will hand over for, to Vera for the second panel. Can you start with? Go ahead, Martin. <laughs> yes, that was the, the, the danger. Thank you. Um, Big, bigger ships. Uh, it's not up to the regulator to to uh, to regulate the size of ships. It should be the market. The condition uh, is, of course, that all external costs should be included in the price of transport. And if that's done, then it's the market that will decide how big the vessels will come. I already already explained that we are supporting uh, the proposal to include a uh, carbon price in uh, for the price of shipping. Once we have the alternative fuels, there's, there's no, no discussion about it. On other uh, emissions, for example, underwater noise, it can also be done by innovation. Propellers, hull size, et cetera. Slow, slow steaming ships are already, already slow steaming. So it's, it should be up left to the market to decide on the, sh the, ships of, uh, the size of ships. And I want to refer to one slide that, that Olaf uh, sh uh, showed us. And that's a very good shot. It showed the average size of a container vessel under 5,000 TU, the average size, and the, the maximum size 25,000 TU, meaning there are a lot of container vessels relatively small. So we should not focus only on the big ones. Uh, we should look at the sector. It's the market that decides on which routes we can use the, the bigger vessels, and perhaps they might become even bigger if there's a carbon price introduced. The EU ETS might lead to even bigger vessels. If that's the choice for, uh, for, the, for, the, um, for the operator uh, to deal with that, okay, that's the market. It's, and the regulator uh, introduces that, that carbon price. So we should have a very careful look at what is it what we talk about? What are the statistics saying of, is there a correlation as sometimes suggested by Olaf, or is that just a suggestion? Is, is it working in practice in another way? And on some points, it is working in another way. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Martin. Nicolette. Thank you. I would like to, uh, to answer your question. Um, I think that all the, the, the smaller container vessels cascaded to niche markets. To be honest, and Martin knows this, I think the, uh, the, the, on the uh, large uh, Europe-Asia trades, of course, where 
the majority of the shipping takes place, but also to, to, to maybe to the US, we only see the, um, the MECA container vessels. And they are here, probably they're here to stay. I mean, shipping is a deregulated market, but my, my thinking then would be, uh, if you look at the, the European road transport market, if you look at the rail transport market, they're all regulated because of the risk they, and, and they have to operate in, in, in economies. Uh, I would not be against some sort of a regulation there. And maybe at some point even uh, today, I can't say that shipping is cheap anymore. If, uh, if the cost of a container is up to $20,000, uh, um, that, that you can't claim that that, that, is, that is a cheap um, transport cost. I know that, and we actually, within Playcut, we discussed it. There's, of course, a risk of nearshoring. People are looking at, at other areas for production. They're looking at Turkey, to, at Eastern Europe, to go nearer. We also have uh, shippers um, that claimed recently in, in one of our events that they are looking to other modes that to, to use rail freight from China, which maybe is more reliable. It seems to be much more reliable. Of course, with the volumes, the rail freight, the market cannot sort of operate and handle all those volumes. But uh, I think that, that there, there may be a knock-on effect also on the shipping market that would be really a pity for all those investments. And um, yeah, maybe to say something on the data that, that um, Martin is referring to, we would be really happy if you can share the data because no doubt the shipping industry itself has the data. Um, and to come forward to that, with that, because um, yeah. Um, but uh, let's keep it to the, the question you raised. I think there's definitely, um, it's going to be a trend. And, and actually a point I had, have not, had not had a chance to make is that we do, support and uh, an ETS system for shipping as ClayCut. We do support that, that sort of uh, pricing for CO2. And that goes, uh, that indeed is much more ambitious than that what we currently see at the IMO. That's so, that's true in any case, <laughs> having listened to so many, so many member states um, in the IMO making their contribution, I was like, okay, hey, nothing will ever, ever happen here or at least not anytime soon. So, Jakob, it's for oh, you there, to, to sum up. With the, with the, uh, &E. So, Jakob, it's for you to sum up. And just one very small remark on markets, Martin. Um, there is no market without rules. Even black markets have rules. So it's our job to set the rules for the market to deliver not only the cost efficient, but um, the generation efficient way, because these are costs that are there, there. We are passing them on to the next generations. The German Umweltbundesamt has um, calculated that the cost of a ton of CO2 emitted today in 2100 um, is correlated to a damage of over 600 euro. And these are costs which we just shift into the future. And it's our job as politicians to bring those rules to the market in order to make those costs visible. But I'll pass on to Jakob. A short remark on this, uh, Utah, because you refer to me. I fully agree. A strong market needs a strong government. Gov markets have to be regulated. Otherwise, the outcome would be, well, a wild west e economy. That's not acceptable. And, and I also fully agree that shipping should decarbonize as quickly as possible. And once again, we are supportive of having a carbon price for the fossil fuels, we have to make the switch to the, those uh, zero carbon fuels as quickly as possible. So that's why we as a shipping industry at European and international level, we are so active to make that happen. And we also introduced the proposal to, to have an international R&D fund established, uh, 5 billion euros, to, uh, US dollars, total effect 10 billion US dollars to make the switch eh, to, to, to do the, the, the research and development for these alternative fuels. I wish they were here already, then we could make the switch, then we could have the carbon price immediately at a global level. And I, but I fully share your goal. That's, that's not the discussion, thank you. So to, yeah, just the final word on me, I'll try to be very quick. I think just on the, on the question you asked on to things like reshoring and circular economy, these are very, very interesting kind of arguments and maybe this is, but obviously maybe not to kind of, for me to conjecture on. But I do think the, the issue about circular economy is definitely worth thinking about because if we have a circular economy in the next 10, 20 years, what it means is less, less traffic. 
So if we have this trend towards much, much bigger, bigger ships, but also we, we, we can envisage in 20 years less traffic, then there is an issue here. And this does come into the, this kind of more, uh, yeah, this wider argument about the market and about what to do, because I think Yuta is, it's completely correct what you say, but all the time, what Martin says is true that we should leave things to the market as much as we can, but let's not forget climate change and all of these other local environmental issues are kind of gaping up failures of the market. And if we don't, don't do something now thinking about future generations, knowing what's going to happen in the future, then as you've said, we're just leaving it to future generations, which is not possible. Um, so, so exactly. I mean, but the point is to focus on what we can do now, which is to be as ambitious as possible in Europe. Uh, and it's not going to be easy in terms of fuels. No one said it was going to be easy. If there was another fuel, obviously we'd go for it, which is why we need to be incredibly ambitious and strong in setting the legislative framework now so that in 10 years time we have, you know, we push the market towards uh, the clean zero emissions vessels. Yes, thank you very much. And I think we have taken up 10 minutes longer than we should have. Um, it's my fault. I should have should have been the timekeeper here. So please forgive me, Vera, and I will pass on to you for the moderation of the second panel. Thank you so much, Yuta. And uh, yes, I, I, it's difficult as a politician to not give you opinion uh, during the debate, I know, but uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll get this, this in time. Uh, uh, we manage both. Um, so now we have the second panel and we have four speakers and each speaker gets five minutes uh, and because it would be nice if we also uh, come to a conclusion and also have questions uh, after, after this panel. Um, for the first uh, panelist, uh, the theme, uh, if you don't know yet, is big ships seen from the shore side. So the other perspective uh, from the shore side. And first of all, let me introduce to you uh, Magda Kobzinska. Uh, I don't see you yet, but I guess uh, I, I don't have all, all the people in front of me. Welcome, Magda. Nice to have you here. And she is director of the waterborne transport at DJ Move in the uh, of the EU Commission. So uh, again, welcome, Magda. Nice to see you. And I'm really interested in the reaction from your perspective, perspective from the EU Commission uh, on the situation as described. Uh, thank you very much, Vera. I hope I'm seen and I'm heard. If you just, okay, you know that you have. Yes, thank you. Yes, yes thank you. Thank you. And, uh, and good afternoon, everybody. Fortunately, I was, I was lucky to actually be able to join the previous uh, panel earlier than expected. It, it's a day of shipping with the European Parliament. That's my second event in a row with MEPs talking about shipping, different aspects, but still. Um, so I, I'm, I'm a bit puzzled because uh, three quarters of what I wanted to say has been covered by other speakers. So I'm gonna, th that will make cutting down to five minutes uh, even, even faster, but I'm really looking forward to questions, discussions, and also hearing those panelists who will come after me. Um, I think, and, and I probably am repeating a bit what, what you already heard. Um, I think the, 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 the sort of the excuse for the event today is, 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 is the case is the case of ever given blocking Suez Canal. But I would just like to, to recall that um, it's, it's, it's the Suez Canal and it's the COVID situation that disrupted uh, a smooth functioning of the maritime chain. I know that some of the speakers and probably also some of those who are watching that debate will not necessarily agree with the smooth functioning but you know, normally I always I always complain that shipping shipping is not really a, vis a visible sector. And when I say shipping, I I should be saying maritime transport because I also include ports. This is the sector that normally works so well that nobody cares about it until either ever given happens or we start seeing the type of disruption that has been happening over the last uh, 14, 16 months. I think Martin in his intervention explained a bit the, the, the flow of events, you know, where, where, uh, where blockages occurred first and then second, and Europe stopped or China stopped, Europe stopped, US stopped, then China moved and Europe started to move so and so forth. We should also not forget 
that another element that was extremely important in during COVID was the huge impact that that the situation had on people who were working in all sectors, on ships, but also on the shore side. I saw in the chat that somebody asked a question why we are not talking about workers. I think please don't, don't if, if, if the word doesn't come in the in the discussion, that doesn't mean that we were not concerned with people working in the maritime uh, chain throughout COVID. But coming back to, to the main point, you know, the, 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 the size of vessels, are they too big, are they too small? I, I think the problem that we are seeing with maritime transport is that it's, it, it's, it's a sector that has been extremely um, efficient in organizing itself. And efficiency very often means that you're functioning with minimum uh, spare capacity. So the moment we've seen the COVID situation, whatever spare capacity there was anywhere, it's been used up. And then we we saw that all of a sudden that that capacity is is missing, lacking. You know, no containers, no vessels, ports being troubled because of slowdowns uh, on the on the on the seaside with with less less planned arrivals and departures and so on and so forth. But I also believe that maritime transport has been uh, the sector that has proven on so many occasions that it can rebound and it will. And what we are seeing now is still unusual situation. And let's not forget, even if, you know, I assume all of us or most of us are vaccinated, ready to travel, ready to go back to our old way of functioning, but the world as such is not yet out of COVID. And when we are talking about a global sector like shipping, it is heavily impacted by situations also elsewhere in the world and not just, not just in the EU. So everything that we are observing about how the sector functions is unusual situation. And I'm saying that because on the one hand, crisis situations are good excuses to push for looking again into our policies, you know, for legislative regulatory framework, but on the other hand, crisis situations are not necessarily ideal. Um, or in, no, let me put it differently. Crisis situations require careful analysis so that whatever decisions we take as the effect of those crisis situations does not actually put the entire sector and its functioning on, on, on its head. And it does not actually disrupt uh, what, what, what has been working rather smoothly. I'm very well aware of the many questions that were put in, in, in Olaf Merck's presentation. Uh, we, we've, talked, we've talked with, with Nicolette and, 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 and the stakeholders of, of her organization. Often, I, I also believe that, that I do know what, 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 will, what will come at least partially in the, in the discussion that will follow. But just to say that on the commission side, we, 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 are, we are looking at the situation, but I, I really don't think that we should be jumping into a policy decision, uh, unraveling everything that has been functioning uh, relatively well. Yes. Just to tell you also that, and that's gonna be the last thing that I'm gonna say, that we, we are also not looking on that our, on, on our own, we have also uh, been in touch with, with uh, competition authorities on the other side of the Atlantic, with the FMA uh, on the US side. We'll be having our, um, uh, we have regular meetings with, with uh, other competition authorities uh, globally. And that question of the assessment of the situation in the maritime sector has been on the agenda of our discussions. I'm not touching on the environmental dimension because I'm sure it will come later on. So I'm happy to come uh, in the second part. Thank of you, yes. I stop here, thank you. Thank you, Magda, it's so nice. Uh, you are in time and, uh, and address everything uh, we would like you to, uh, to address. Uh, so next uh, is our speaker and someone, uh, as mentioned by Magna, was, was, uh, we are speaking for an hour but not uh, uh, addressing uh, from a worker's perspective. Uh, but our next speaker is uh, Livia Spira and she's the General Secretary of the European Transport Workers' Federation. So welcome, uh, Livia. Uh, to you, the question also five minutes. Uh, what are the consequences of mega ships for workers such as dockers and seafarers? but also drivers uh, in combined transport. Uh, what can you tell us uh, about that perspective? Thank you very much, Vera, and thank you also to uh, Jutta Paulus for having organized this together with FIBORT and ETF. 
Um, I, I will go straight to the point, but first of all, allow me to express deep frustration. Um, there are a lot of members of the ETF attending this meeting, and I feel that they're also equally frustrated because um, uh, this is not a new situation. Huh? Uh, so it was said uh, by several of the speakers that, that spoke before me, uh, Suez Canal COVID came as a bit of a cherry on the cake, uh, exacerbating a bit of situation that was already present. Uh, there is a broad coalition of stakeholders, as we as are seeing today. So unions, uh, logistic operators, port operators, uh, uh, shippers, uh, uh, and uh, you name it, um, that are not necessarily um, always working together closely. Uh, and they all happen to say to say the same thing regarding the, the maritime supply chain and in particular shipping. But uh, what we find in front of us is ship owners who have very, very defensive attitudes. So they are not ready for a dialogue. We heard what the approach was. We, we have read it in the chat as well. Uh, they are not ready for dialogue. They are just defending their position. But their position and that the status quo uh, doesn't have to be put in question. And but what is what is uh, what is even more shocking is the position that the that the that Magda has just expressed. The maritime, the shipping sector works so well that do not need any intervention. This is even more shocking because you may remember that now, now it's a bit the past, but um, you may remember that there were two port packages and one port regulation with a bit of fuss around it that were uh, exactly made because there were so many critics about how the port sector was working and wasn't efficient and so, while everything is perfect on the, on the shipping side. I mean, this is, I find, a bit... Uh, as I said, a bit frustrating. So let's try to overcome this um, a bit this dogmatic approach, and let's try to to have a dialogue. And that's why we have organized this meeting today. Um, also, regarding what was said before, uh, the, the the commission has the, has taken a decision on the block exemption regulation. If the commission has decided this, that's true. I mean, the commission for those of of, of you who believe in God, the commission is not uh, uh, acting of, on the basis of. Uh, uh, of uh, of uh, of uh, uh, God power, the Commission is taking decisions that are very often biased um, and and politically oriented. So let's not so not take it as a, um, as something we have to uh, accept as it is. So what are the effects on labor of mega ships? What were the effects in particular uh, during the COVID and Swiss Canal? No need to mention. Uh, are there, are there uh, uh, effects at all uh, of the mega ships and of the alliances and so on labor? Yes, there are. Um, certainly the life of seafarers has not improved at all. We've seen and we still see how many of them are uh, blocked on board ships. Um, what is the effect on the, on the other workers? Well, uh, if we look at the, at, at the dockers, at the port workers in general, because ports are larger than just the, the, the docks, um, even though there are not not studied, it is not been studied extensively, and um, probably uh, the studies published by the idea for ECD are among the few uh, studies that have mentioned this, and this also gives us ideas. Probably in the future we could have a fourth study. We could have a cooperation again with idea for ECD for exploring this. But uh, if we look, when we talk to our members, is, uh, many of them can intervene later, it, it's very clear uh, that the, when the bargaining powers, uh, power of uh, terminal uh, is so low compared to shipping companies, this has a cascading effect on, on part workers. It's much more difficult for us to renew collective bargaining agreement. It's much more difficult for us to defend and improve a working condition for the workers we represent on in, in the ports. Um, it has oft, of course an effect on, 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 on labor patterns. You know that one of the enemies of the ship owners and of the European Commission for many years has been the labor, uh, the, 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 the port labor schemes, the so-called labor pools. These have been an obsession. And yet these pools are the only way ports can cope with this kind of situation that originate from mega ships, from, from the blockage in the Suez Canal. This was the only way through negotiation by using this, uh, this, uh, 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 these labor schemes that allow flexibility. Uh, this was the only way uh, how ports could cope uh, with the peaks and lows that originated that were exacerbated uh, uh, through by the blockage in the Suez Canal. So this is also the contradiction. On the one side, ship owners have always been at the forefront of attacking these schemes. 
On the other side, there are those who are actually benefiting these schemes because it's the only way that ports can uh, reverse the uh, negative effect of the development in shipping. That affects also on uh, uh, crews uh, on board tags. Uh, this is a small sector, but it, it's a very crucial one. Um, there are, of course, there are uh, shipping alliances uh, that have, again, a, a bigger bargaining power with uh, companies. They, they uh, establish uh, global contracts. It's a race to the bottom. In some cases, there is also vertical integration of, of these companies. And again, we see a, a push for uh, uh, lower accruing uh, requirements, uh, very difficult to negotiate uh, collective bargaining agreements, very difficult to renew collective bargaining agreements. And there is also a third sector in maritime that is affected by this, that this is the feeder sectors, uh, because this is, a, 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 um, uh, Olaf said it very well, this is a sector that is, developing uh, 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 due to the development of mega ships. But at the same time, if you look at the working condition there, uh, these are no, all non EU workers in EU waters. Um, they are imposed tasks such as slashing that they shouldn't be doing. Um, and they are, uh, they are uh, constantly under pressure. There is a lot of, there are a lot of problems with fatigue, with health and safety. And again, this pressure is increasing through uh, the use of mega ships. Uh, no need to mention the effects on, on the road, truck drivers with all the problems we have, uh, queues, uh, congestions, and so on. And also for the, for the for port workers, uh, maritime workers are normally citizens in, in port areas, and this has negative effect on also uh, the environment, on the pollution, on the environment they, they work on. So um, the, the, maritime, the maritime sector is broader than shipping, and we can discuss whether the maritime sector deserves uh, subsidies, uh, tax exemptions, and so, uh, but we can also discuss if the rest of the maritime chain, if these this subsidies should be redistributed more equally, so as to take into account also the benefit of workers, because we invest, uh, we can invest in one or the other transport sector, but we also have to take into account that there is no point in uh, investing public money if there is no return in employment. Um, and, and the last thing is, uh, I mean, ship owners will always do what they are allowed to do as anybody, any other category. So let's put it clear. So the, 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 the big discussion here is what regulators are up to, up to uh, in order to, uh, uh, to make things more sustainable, more just to everybody, uh, just, more just to workers as well. Um, because if we allow what, these or that group of, of, of uh, uh, um, uh, employers or, or companies to do things, of course, they will do this. So really, uh, I think the, the discussion has to be taken at, regulator, at regulator's level, um, and it has to be a maritime uh, uh, supply chain discussion, not just focus um, strictly on shipping. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Livia. Uh, but also for me, for one question, because it, it's, uh, it's clearly, uh, as you state, um, a, a bit of frustrating that we talk so much and then uh, uh, only now uh, from a worker's perspective. But to be, for me to be um, uh, uh, sure about this, so from your point of perspective, from the ETF, you, you say we need legislation on, on that ships and vessels don't get bigger. Is that is that something you wish, or that's something? You no, know, we need better regulations, but on bigger or smaller ships, we don't have a, a, stand, a point of view. Yeah, I mean, if I mean trucks and planes and any other uh, uh, transport means is regulated, so we don't see why we shouldn't have a dialogue on how uh, ships should be regulated, taking into account that this is creating uh, more expenditure for 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 the rest of the world. So, and especially with a lot of public money, so. We can't, we can't enlarge the, 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 the size of train all of a sudden, but why can we do it with ships? Okay, thank you. Um, we have two more speakers to go uh, before we come to the end conclusions. And our next speaker is uh, Lamia Kaduch Belkaid. Uh, she is Secretary General of the Federation of European Private Port Companies and Terminals, better known as Freeport. Welcome, uh, Lamia. Really nice to see you. I already congratulated, I've complimented you on the on the great background you have. 
So can you tell us what are the consequences of increasing ship sizes for ports and terminals? Thank you, Vera, and, and thank you. First, I would like really uh, warmly thank you with the, together with Juta for uh, listening to us when we came to you to discuss this issue of port congestion, indeed uh, together with ETF, because uh, we were as Freeport and also ETF very shocked by what we heard and read in the press with respect to the causes of disruption of the maritime logistic chain, which were namely, uh, I, I would say, uh, the, 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 the main reason was actually the lack of efficiency of ports. And, and this was for us a really a, a shock because Indeed, um, we, we, as it was mentioned by several speakers, uh, ports are doing a lot and since many years adapting and, and trying to cope with all the changes, uh, which are, by the way, not always market driven, no? because I heard earlier that Martin was saying that uh, it's market driven, but who is the market? I think that the decision is, is of course, uh, the ship owner's decision, and, and of course, we respect their decisions as, as, uh, as companies and, and, and uh, undertakings. But at the same time, we are also on, on the private side in, in ports, and we are also uh, compelled to invest to also accommodate bigger ships and cope with the change. So I think that um, uh, we, we, we need a bit to, to clarify, as, as Livia said, and we need probably to discuss a bit more this, uh, this, the impact of, of decisions that are very often unilateral ones. We don't have really a discussion prior to the, the, the investment that is made on the seaside. And this is something we have been saying for a long time. So for us, COVID, uh, probably COVID and, and the, the Suez are only catalysts for us to see what is going on for already many, many years. Uh, and, and I think that this is a good opportunity actually to, to, to focus on, on what is going on. Um, I, I would like also to say a few things. Um, everybody was afraid from uh, what uh, the, the consequences of, of Suez. Uh, but, but in fact, what happened is that the European ports have been coping with the situation. And this has been done in a very silent way. No advertisement, no papers, no, you know, uh, a lot of news. Uh, we have not seen that. But uh, contrary to what we have seen in the previous months, where we were stigmatized as ports, uh, port stakeholders, and everybody was complaining from uh, for, uh, about congestion. So I think that um, I agree with Magda. We should celebrate a bit more ports, and I fully agree with Livia. I think ports are also a, an important stakeholder, uh, I, I, be it on the public or private side, doing a lot uh, to to make the supply chain uh, function. And this was very, I think, very useful because once the cargo reaches ports, it needs to be unloaded and it needs to reach its final destination. And I would like to pay tribute to all the transport workers, not only, I would say, on the seaside, but also on the land side and not only on, at, the, at the level of ports, but also downstream the port. And I, my, my, my colleague, Ther Ther Theresa, will say uh, something about that a bit later. Uh, what I wanted to say, because I think a lot has been already said, we, what we miss, uh, uh, if we start to talk about resilience, for me, resilience uh, it means maturity, but it also means cooperation. Uh, and I think that this is not what has happened in these last years. Uh, I'm very sorry, but uh, when I hear that the BER was actually, the consortia BER was renewed because we had actually, uh, uh, there were good arguments and, and, and there, were, there was no economic, uh, uh, I would say, uh, study that, that actually um, was, was justifying the, the, uh, the renewal of the consortia BER. Uh, this, this was done on a pure legal, I would say, on the four criteria that were used by DG Competition to assess the importance of this regulation. So I think we agree, data is needed. Uh, from my point of view, the data that has been shown today, even if I do not, uh, I'm not, I'm not an economist and able to assess all, I would say, the data that has been provided. I, 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 I think this was indeed a, an important data showing, at least for the poor sector, the impact of, of big ships. When you have a big one, I think that you don't need to, to, uh, to, to do a lot of uh, very long studies to understand for a, from the port perspective. If you have one big ship coming every three days, this means less like uh, a lot technical unemployment for four other days 
for workers. It means fixed costs for the for the, the companies which are in ports, like my members, for instance. So, so for us, obviously, we would prefer to have more frequent calls, more ships coming into ports, probably having presenting less problem problems in terms of you know um, uh, uh, maintenance, uh, dredging, etc. Of course, but we, we ca can still do with big ones. But then in terms of economic model, and this is what is the discussion today is, is, is about, is are we going to put our eggs in one single basket? Shouldn't we try also to, big, to build medium-sized ships? Because I think that this is also what the market probably needs. I don't, I'm not sure that the market needs only a massification of the flows. And we saw it with COVID. COVID probably there will be some relocation, a reshoring. And, and maybe this is what we need to prepare when we talk about resilience and recovery. And this is where we need the regulator, and especially from the parliament side, this is where we need your support in trying to understand what is going to happen in order not to be compelled to uh, actually um, accept any kind of model, uh, which is, by the way, not al always, I would say, uh, only about European strategies, because uh, I'm very happy to have a very strong European fleet and, and, and uh, I would say, uh, very um, healthy ship owners. But, but the ships are, most of the ships are built in China. And, and, and again, uh, this, is, this is a model that is run also and benefit to another economy. So, so for us, uh, I would be very glad if tomorrow we have more ships built in Europe, for instance, and, 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 uh, and my colleague from uh, Sea Europe is probably happy to hear that. But uh, this is what I think what we need to start as a discussion, is this model, uh, actually bringing added value for all parties collectively and, and thank you uh, so this thank you i'm sorry to interrupt but but i think no uh, you made really clear uh what your uh, point of view is your perspective so thank you for that uh, and then that brings us to the last speaker uh, of this panel and that's uh theresia hacksteiner she is the Secretary General of the European, European Barge Union, the ABU. Hi, Reggie, nice to see you again. So um, other modes of transport, such as inland navigation, have been adapting to the increasing size of maritime ships and also to port congestion. What are the experience of the inland waterways section? Uh, can you tell us more about that? Uh, you are muted, Theresia. We cannot hear you. Yes, thank you. The classical yes. fault. Um, hi, uh, Vera, and many thanks to you and also to Jutta for organizing uh, this event uh, um, and uh, raising this uh, very important topic. And I, uh, well, many uh, things have already been. Uh, discussed uh, before, but uh, the uh, the contribution from my side is from a different angle, being from the land side and more in particular from the waterway land side. And there, container congestion in the seaports uh, is a huge problem uh, for inland waterway carriers since many years. The reason for that uh, in particular lies uh, in the fact that the uh, barge owners uh, and operators are no part of the contractual uh, relationship between the deep sea terminals and the carriers and nor between the uh, shippers and forwarders and uh, they are thus uh, dependent on other parties uh, uh, such as uh, the uh, deep sea carriers and terminals. Uh, we have also to stress, uh, uh, and I, I uh, therefore disagree uh, in particular also with uh, um, Mark, that uh, the COVID influence uh, even, of course, worsened the situation, but it's not the origin for the problem, nor uh, is, uh, for instance, indeed uh, the uh, uh, ever given uh, accident uh, in uh, what we have experienced already in the last uh, decade is that uh, indeed the landscape of the liner shipping has drastically changed and thus uh, cause uh, 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 to our experience uh, the current uh, situation of uh, uh, container and port congestion uh, with, with a, a detrimental effect on our sector. And uh, what we also have uh, uh, 
uh, discovered that to serve this changed landscape uh, uh, the best, some port authorities uh, developed a policy mainly focusing on volumes and traffic as opposed to quality. And indirectly, uh, this strategy facilitates the current way of acting of liners. Uh, the increasing number of the megaships which call at their premises are a guarantee for an increase in volume and business uh, for these uh, ports. But on the other hand, they have a disrupting effect on the overall quality of the local port operation. In case of any disturbance in the schedule, all other operations are adapted or delayed, resulting in issues for other parties in the supply chain. And for the inland navigation, our members uh, the most visible result is the structural congestion at the case in several European seaports, affecting in particular their reliability, as well as the modal shift amb ambition in a serious way, and uh, also imposing high additional costs on the sector. Our members, uh, together with our association uh, and also the inland ter terminal operators, have undertaken several measures in the past to cope with the problem. They have, for instance, bundled container volumes and set up so-called fixed windows or corridors in order to cope with the operational challenges in the seaports. This has led to operational improvement indeed, but also to substantial costs in the hinterland and to be paid by the shipper for the order barge operator himself and also to less flexi flexibility for the shipper for the barge operator. So in other words, what we experience, there's operational efficiency in the seaports at high cost in the hinterland. And what if the terminals on their part also take measures to cope with the unreliability of the deep sea carriers, for instance, with the so-called cargo opening and cargo closing, uh, this also led to uh, operational issues for our members. In uh, concrete terms, uh, this led to a serious imbalance uh, and uh, an essential link in the international container trade. Uh, it also should be uh, about uh, the guaranteeing a certain level of services and overall reliability towards all users in the port, resulting in a more smooth and future-proof connection between liner shipping and the entire hinterland operational system and supply chain. Therefore, we are a bit puzzled that uh, uh, the European Commission, on one hand, has uh, recently uh, released its uh, new policy framework, uh, which was already expected since uh, a couple of years, uh, the uh, European Green Deal, and also further elaborated in its uh, sustainable and smart mobility strategy, in which it for instance, announces a substantial uh, increase of uh, modal share uh, towards uh, uh, inland waterway transport. But on the other hand, it has also uh, 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 continued to grant specific uh, uh, positions to certain parties in the chain, for instance, with uh, the uh, consortia block exemption regulation. So therefore, we are uh, uh, indeed also uh, calling upon uh, the Commission uh, to take appropriate actions uh, to um, create a kind of level playing field in order to cope with this uh, uh, problem, which is uh, indeed not a problem of uh, today or yesterday, but already uh, known since many years uh, to the parties involved and also the European Commission. And uh, in our belief, also the Commission has a role to play as it has, the, uh, as the boards have a, uh, their role to play and uh, the carriers have their role to play, uh, but in particular, uh, uh, we call upon, uh, it has been uh, mentioned uh, already by uh, a couple of previous uh, speakers, uh, uh, a monitoring system to monitor the situation, uh, uh, to collect uh, indeed all the necessary information uh, in order to gain a balance uh, between all parties involved and uh, uh, well, and also allowing uh, a proper functioning of the entire supply chain. And I think I don't uh, need to repeat all the arguments that have been brought up uh, by the previous speakers. So uh, we would like uh, to strongly also uh, 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 support and uh, to me uh, uh, the presentation by Olaf uh, uh, at the very beginning was a very clear one. And I think he highlighted a couple of uh, measures uh, that could be very helpful uh, to overcome the situation. And uh, uh, in concrete terms, it needs a, a kind of uh, 
uh, open and close uh, cooperation between all the parties involved, uh, creating a level playing field uh, and to, uh, uh, well, to cope with the situation uh, from a transparent uh, perspective. Well, thank you, Theresa. Thank you for your, uh, for your uh, valuable uh, point of view. And uh, you were the last speaker of the, uh, of the second panel. And again, I, I think uh, uh, the combination of uh, first introduction of Olaf and there from panel one and panel two, we see how, uh, as I already told you at the beginning, a really, really interesting lineup we have. So we see uh, a, a really different perspective sometimes on the same uh, solutions. We are uh, on the same problem and what are the solutions. So uh, for me, uh, uh, to, to trying to, uh, to conclude a little bit uh, from my perspective, uh, this was really helpful uh, uh, doing my job and, and thinking about uh, what are the issues of the future and how, what should we do from a European Union perspective. And uh, that could even, as you already know, uh, also uh, be um, uh, not the same as, as you said, but thank you all, all the speakers and all, and also the respectful way that you uh, uh, were, uh, were trying to, to uh, have this conversation. Uh, I thank you for that. It was really helpful. And first of all, for me, the, the presentation of Olaf and all the policy advisors, I take them by heart because for me, this was really, uh, uh, those were remarks I uh, would like to think about. And, uh, and, and, and I have to think about this event to make sure that every, every perspective is, is weighed in the possible way. But um, yes, it was really helpful for me. And to be more specific, uh, as a social democrat, I'm a strong supporter of the best possible working conditions for transport workers, safer, fairer stock workers, and already for, for truck drivers. So the problem of port congestion and peaks, uh, I think it really contributes in a negative way. And also, um, as a policymaker, um, I think whenever uh, society changes, we have to make new and better rules not to make more rules, but uh, if we see that there is a problem, we have to act. And I heard also some of you, like Magda said, well, if there is a crisis, don't, uh, don't change policy uh, right away because it's a crisis. It's something that not happened uh, uh, every time. But, but, but then I'm more of the uh, people who think that, no, this is, I, I guess, somebody of you already mentioned it. it this is not uh, just a crisis, it's a catalysator. It's, it's, making, uh, it's making more obvious where the problems are, who are already there, who already exist. Uh, I'm, not a, I'm not a person who wants to make more rules, but in this case, I, I really think that we should really think about uh, also the advices we, we, we got from uh, Olaf. Uh, I will really think about it. And especially uh, if we see that on trucks and buses, uh, we, are, we have regulation in the EU uh, by the so-called weight and dimensions directive, uh, yes, I really think that, uh, that we must uh, uh, comply with these rules and also now uh, uh, search for a way to also uh, get shipping into these uh, uh, weights and dimensions directive because, um, uh, because I, really, I really listen carefully and this is my, uh, my point of view uh, uh, for now. So, um, to give also uh, Jutta uh, Paulus the floor and uh, uh, come to her conclusions and, and let her say thank you. Last uh, uh, remark, a special thanks to Freeport and ETF because they were really uh, inspiring me uh, to, to come together like this. So thank you for that. And now I'll give the floor to Jutta Paulus for the last uh, remarks. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Vera. And uh, from my side also, thank you to all our distinguished speakers and also to the organizers, the technical staff in the background that made this event possible. For me personally, it has yet been another um, glimpse into the, the heterogeneous world of shipping, I might say so, and also to, well, maybe rethink the concept of um, looking only at the efficiency of the fuel consumption, but also take into account other environmental and societal issues when 
we are looking at the developments in the shipping sector. Um, I've been trying to follow the chat in parallel. I've seldom experienced such an active chat during an event, and I might come back to one of, the, one of you or the other. And uh, please do not hesitate to contact me if there are any special needs or um, wishes or anything that might be related also to the fuel EU maritime file, which will be coming up. And I think we all as European policymakers should try to reflect all sides for, for also the maritime sector. Um, as green, I'm all, of course focusing on the environmental issues, but it was very, very valuable for me to, to hear the, the societal issues of the workers that are um, employed in the ports and on the ships. Of course, there have been quite some coverages in the media, but mainly focusing the working conditions on cruise ship vessels, because these are much more in the focus of the public, but not so much on the container vessels. This, this only started with the current crisis, where a lot of seafarers were deprived of um, of leaving the ship and going home. So from my side again, thank you very much for this important event and for your contribution. And um, I believe that we will meet again at the uh, one or the uh, other occasion. And I would like to give the very final word to Fipor. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Juta, and thank, thank you, Vera, again. And I think that uh, I will share my, my time, my few minutes also with, with Livia on behalf of ETF. As I said, we it all started with a very uh, important uh, discussion with you, both of you, Juta, and, and with Vera, about the fact that we, we found it really, uh, I would say, appalling that we were at some point bashed as port stakeholders uh, on, on the port congestion, which was not the real, uh, the real reason for this disruption. And, and I think uh, it is very uh, important for the EU to value all the different segments of the maritime logistic chain uh, and all the workers along the chain, because this is the wealth also of the European Union. Uh, to have to can to rely on on those workers, uh, I think that indeed we, we need to carry on uh, the discussion, and and we are happy uh, as FIPO to continue this with you. I leave it to Livia if you want to say a few words. Thank you very much for everything. Thank you, Lamia, and yeah, just uh, uh, very shortly, not to keep uh, anybody uh, online. Um, I think it was a very, very lively, very, very uh, heartfelt discussion. There is a lot of passion around these discussions. And I think it's not the first appeal and it's not the first occasion for a dialogue that we launch as ETF and Freeport together. By the way, ETF and Freeport uh, are not, uh, um, do not agree on everything. So when we agree on something, it means that it's uh, something very important. Uh, but uh, uh, joking apart, I think it's not the first appeal that we send for, for a dialogue. Uh, and I think in the future, we should launch really concrete initiative for, uh, for, uh, for a dialogue around shipping with the stakeholders, but also with, uh, uh, with, uh, 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 with the institution. So uh, I'm sure what I, what I heard from, from Yuta and Vera is very promising. I feel a uh, very strong in interest around this and I hope that the uh, European Parliament will take the lead and will also slowly uh, push the Commission to, uh, to move into uh, uh, um, uh, uh, more constructive dialogue around uh, the maritime supply chain. And thanks again to all those who are involved in the preparation and in the making of this uh, seminar today. So thank you all and goodbye. Bye bye, thank you. Bye bye, bye. Goodbye, thank you. Goodbye, thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Ciao Nicolette. Ciao bye. Ciao. Ciao, ciao. Bye, thank you.